Um, I'm a breast surgeon uh, from Kilmarnock and like many of you I've been campaigning for the last year and a half and I didn't start following the story of what was happening down south because of the referendum. I started following it way back in 2011 because I couldn't believe what they even said they were thinking of doing and I started looking at their media. And the reason I spoke out at the beginning of this year was the fact that you thought there was a media blackout up here. Because I get sent a media link every day from my college and I would see the articles in all the national newspapers south of the border, the Scottish edition, not a breath. And so I started speaking out. And it's something that we all need to be aware of before we make this decision next Thursday. Now, if you're really struggling to make up your mind what you're going to do, what I would ask you to do is to just turn that decision the other way around. And imagine, we're a small, North European, relatively modern country. We're reasonably wealthy, we're lucky enough to have oil. What's left in the North Sea, plus what's off Shetland, what's in the Clyde. We've got our whiskey, our food and drink, our tourism, our universities. Our universities are very inventive, and they're very well connected with manufacturing and engineering. And then suddenly we get an offer from our big neighbour to the south, is whether we would like to join them in a union. And it's a one-off offer, but we would have to accept to not be a state anymore, to not be a country. We would decide to become a region and become part of their country. And if you just give that a wee bit of thought, and think about how would you vote in that. They used to have a huge empire and they still like to punch above their weight militarily in the world. So they spend quite a lot on defence and they spend quite a lot on foreign wars. We were quite glad that we weren't in Iraq in 2003 but they've made it clear that if we unify with them this is where they're going to want to keep their nuclear weapons and their nuclear submarines. We are fairly pro-Europe. We like to just argue from within and sort the problems of it. But yet they are talking about going out in two years. We are very strong believers in public services for our citizens. Whereas their government believe in the market. Everything should be done by the market. And they believe in big business. So just think, if that was your choice... Would you be voting to give up your independence and become a region in another country? Because that is what you are doing, because you're giving up future independence. You're giving up where we could be ten years from now. Now, since devolution, our NHS got rid of Mrs. Thatcher's trusts and went back to being a single, unified, cooperative, public NHS. And because of that, we've been able to do projects to improve patient safety and projects on improving the quality of treatment, particularly for a lot of the common cancers. And I had the honour to be involved in some of that. For the last year and a half, the NHS in England has been on a journey to be broken up and franchised out. The Health Secretary in England is no longer legally responsible to ensure that every citizen in England has health care. That is a key fact. People can fall through the net. There's no longer a legal responsibility. We still have that, that the Cabinet Secretary here is legally responsible. The decisions on what services to offer are made by groups of commissioning GPs who decide what services are going to be provided in an, in an area. And all of the services they put out to commission must be tendered between the NHS and private companies. And in the first year of those changes, since April 2013, 70% of all of those contracts were taken by private firms like Virgin, Atos, Serco, Care UK. Now, in a survey of NHS leaders, 50% of them thought it was inevitable that patients would be paying charges within 10 years. In actual fact, that's already happening. There are little charges that are creeping in around the edges. And there was an article I came across in the Daily Mail, of all things, just a few days ago, 
where they did a freedom of information request to the hospital trusts in England about a thing that's called self-funding. And what that showed was that a third of trusts who replied are pushing self-funding. Now, it used to be, up until last year, that an NHS hospital was only allowed to make 2% of its income from private patients. That bar has been raised to 49%. So almost half of a hospital we built with our taxes, staff we trained with our taxes, machines we bought with our taxes, is allowed to be used for people who are paying for it. Because of the cuts in England in services, what they are doing is they are rationing a lot more of operations you can have, treatments you can have. And what self-funding does is say, well, if you want to pay the NHS price, you can have it. If you want to pay the NHS price, you can have it straight away, instead of maybe waiting six months or a year. And quite a lot of these trusts have got these things up on their websites. To see a doctor, £50 for an appointment. Get something taken off under local anaesthetic, £300. A kind of operation that will take about an hour, £1,200. Radiation treatment for cancer, £10,000. These are the prices that are on their websites. So people in England are already paying and already being pushed to pay. Now, two of the big think tanks that come up with ideas for the government, Reform UK and the King's Fund, those will be names you recognise, they're suggesting that there should be basic charges, ranging from paying £10 a month into an NHS club to paying £25 a time when you go to your GP or go to accident or emergency. And I've heard people who are better off saying, well, I would pay £10 to save the NHS. I would pay £25 to save the NHS. But I'm sorry, if you are paying £25 to go and see a doctor, you haven't saved the NHS. The NHS would be dead. The 66-year experiment of free health care when you need it would be over. Now, the excuse given for all of this destruction south of the border is that it's to increase efficiency and decrease costs. Well, it hasn't managed to decrease costs because in actual fact, they had to bail out 40% of all hospitals in England to the tune of £500 million. And that's why they keep saying, oh, health spending has increased. Yeah, that wasn't exactly the plan. That was a bailout. You can look up yourself a thing on the internet, a report by a group called the Commonwealth Fund. Now, it's nothing to do with the games. This is a think tank in America that compares the American systems with other health systems to criticise America, to see how America is performing. And we're usually included. And they've just published their 2014 report, and it's called Mirror Mirror. So if you look up Commonwealth Fund and then look up Mirror Mirror, what you will see is the UK system, and this was based on data from 2011 to 2013, so before all these changes, but the UK system was number one. We came top in eight out of 11 parameters, including quality, safety, efficiency, patient-centered care, patient access. And we were second cheapest. So if we were actually the best health service in the Western world, and we were second cheapest, what is the excuse for all this destruction south of the border? It's simply one thing. It's ideological. This is a decision to drive people towards a market. This is a decision to offload the expensiveness of looking after our citizens and move them as Mrs. Thatcher dreamt that people would take responsibility for their own health, they would take private insurance, and they would pay. And we've been on a 30-year journey. And there's actually a document from the Adam Smith Institute called The Health of Nations which describes all the steps you have to do to trick a population into not noticing that you are moving from total public delivery to insurance and private health. And it includes things like, well, we could outsource the cleaners and the cooks, because nobody will care about them. And then we could outsource the labs 
and the secretaries, and they'll not notice that. And it literally describes all of this picking off the edges of the NHS. And that explains why for 30 years, my entire career, we have been reorganized and reorganized and reorganized. And if you look at that document, you will see that all of that is a journey. And we got the chance to get off that road in 99, to turn on our heel and go in the opposite direction and go back to being a single public NHS. But we need to realize where they're headed before we decide, are we going to hand the reins back to a government that that's what they believe, that's what they believe they should give to their citizens. Now, as Christine mentioned, there's a thing coming around the corner that is likely to accelerate that, and that's called TTIP. It's a free trade agreement between Europe and America. Now, I have to say, I, the more I've read about it, the less I'm a fan of it at all, but the threat to the NHS and other public services is that big American companies are allowed to come into any aspect of life that is run as a market. And the NHS in England is now a market. Now, other countries in Europe have asked for exemptions, sometimes for very specific industries, others for their public services. Westminster hasn't even asked for an exemption. And the only reason why is if you're on a journey towards private health insurance, the quickest way to get there is to invite in companies like United Health that can do it in their sleep, because that's where they want to get to. Now, we won't be safe from that. Obviously, they jump up and down and say, oh, it's devolved, it's devolved. But you can't exempt a bit of a country from TTIP. Only a state can exempt its own public service. So if we choose next week that we actually have voted to become a region of this country south of us, instead of becoming an independent state, then we will have given up the potential to protect our NHS from American companies. They would simply challenge the devolved border as a trade barrier. And they are able, through these free trade agreements, when they go through, to actually sue governments for billions. Even if it just wrangled on for years and years, it would suck up so much money fighting it in the courts. Now, south of the border, people have been marching about this. There's been a march from Yarrow to London, protesting against TTIP, protesting against the privatisation. We've had remarkably little coverage on that up here. People are out on the streets. Labour MPs are jumping up and down south of the border. As you mentioned, Andy Burnham, along with Michael Meacher. Andy Burnham describes that charges are in, private insurance is the direction, that the NHS is teetering on a cliff edge, and if it isn't saved, it will be gone in five years. And yet when I describe that, I'm a liar or a scaremonger. Now that's up to you to decide. We all have to decide what we believe and what we're going to do next week. But I find it a bit sinister that Labour MPs are jumping up and down south of the border, while north of the border Labour MPs and MSPs say you're exaggerating. The NHS is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Just be quiet. Because they don't want us to see the direction of travel. And then the other thing they throw at us is it's devolved. You have control of it. No one can ever privatise it. Right, okay, it's devolved. So, we don't control our own funding. Westminster control our funding. And yet, we're meant to believe that in perpetuity, nothing could ever, 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 ever happen to it. It's devolved. Don't worry your pretty little heads about it. That's basically what we're being told. Well, I'm sorry, that isn't enough protection at all. As Christine said, if they spend less because they have herded their population into private insurance, we get less. Our block grant has already gone down by 7% since 2010. It's earmarked to have gone down by 16% by 2017. If we vote no, the Barnett formula is out on its ear. And these minimal little tax changes that we'd be allowed to collect an extra 5% of tax from Labour 
will be used to say, you want to keep free NHS, you pay extra tax in Scotland. We've already paid our tax. Why would we want to pay our tax again? But the Barnett formula will be got rid of. And that would take about four billion out of our funding. That's what we spend on secondary schools and primary schools. We couldn't absorb that. That's a third of the NHS budget. We couldn't absorb that without it having an impact on our service. Now, the most important thing to me is simply this fact that Westminster control our budget. As Ian, uh, uh, sorry, Ian, Ivan. <laughs> As Ivan said, you give your wages to your neighbour and they give you back your pocket money. You hand in your wages, you get your housekeeper. It's all the same. You either believe one of two things. You either believe what Ivan has shown you, which is the UK figures, not the Scottish Government, these are produced centrally and nobody argues with them. That we put more money in than we get back and therefore we could afford to be independent and stand on our own two feet and do things our way. Or you believe we're kept. You believe we're subsidy junkies. Well, that isn't right either. We should simply be standing on our own two feet, working hard, generating our money, and then having power to decide how we spend it. Because I tell you, in 10 years' time, not next year or the year after, but in 10 years' time, when English citizens have nothing, they still pay over £8 an item for prescriptions. Their children pay £9,000 a year to go to university. Their elderly do not have free personal care. And gradually, they're having to pay for health care. It isn't credible to believe that in 10 years' time, when they have nothing, they're going to send a big generous pot of money every year to Scotland so that we can keep our free prescriptions, dental checks, eye checks, tuition, free personal care, and a free public NHS. It just isn't credible. Now, I wouldn't like you to think that I'm claiming the NHS in Scotland doesn't have problems and challenges. Absolutely, we do. We're not remotely perfect. But there isn't a single problem we have to which privatisation or franchising is the answer. Our biggest challenge is our terrible general health. We are still the sick man of Europe. And the problem is a lot of that is related to poverty and deprivation. And we will never get to change that unless we can change our society. The only way to deal with poverty and deprivation is work that pays. Work that pays a living wage. It's as simple as that. That's how you get people out of poverty. But the only way you can drive that by encouraging entrepreneurs, by encouraging business, by encouraging startups, by encouraging small and medium sized Scottish companies, not the big multinationals who are threatening us this week, but small local companies who employ local people, is if we control our economy. And that side of our government, we don't control that at all. And that's what we need to be deciding. Are we going to change that? Are we going to take control? What we see in Westminster is that they just want poor people to go away. You know, we should banish them. We should drive them out. We will take all their benefits away. If it was Game of Thrones, they'd be parked in the snow outside the wall. But we don't actually have a wall to park them outside. And all of us spend money on their misery. It costs every single one of us money. We spend money on benefits. We spend money on police. We spend money on prisons. We spend money on addiction services. If we were independent, we could choose to take all the money we spend on failure and invest it in our children in the first place. Because that's how we change the future of of Scotland, is to invest in our children. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to think of the first generation of independent Scots facing a life that was different from what many of us have faced? That's how you change the future. Now, I agree with David Cameron that two out of the three 
best things that Britain has ever done is to create the welfare state and the NHS. Now he put the BBC third and, you know, <laughs> no, not attacking anyone at the back. I wouldn't have done that. Nothing to do with the current referendum. But to me it's obvious. The thing that should be third is free education. That is what changes people. That's what brings the talent out. That's what makes the talent of our young people available to us. I couldn't have gone to university if I was starting now in the English system. I had no family back up. I was on my own in the world at 18 and a half. And to do medicine, it's a five-year course at 9,000 a year plus all your living costs. You're talking between 70 and 80,000 pounds. And I totally understand that the idea is you pay it back later. But as an 18-year-old, I couldn't have signed up to that with no family backing. And in England, they will be losing talent that could be contributing to their society. And we don't want to have that in our future. If we vote yes, it won't be us that's leaving those ideals of what Britain created. We'll be doing it because we want to hang on to them. It's Westminster that's already left. It's Westminster... <laughs> it's Westminster that is breaking up the welfare state. They don't even use the term social security anymore. Many of you may be comfortably off, you may be in a good job, you might have some savings, but none of us know the day or the hour. And that's what we used to have, that you would never actually hit the rocks. And we don't have that. We're losing that safety net. It's them that's privatising the NHS, and they've already taken away free education from their own citizens. So if these are things that we value, that we think really define us as a society, as a people, that we believe in working with each other, why would you give control away? Why would you vote to not be an independent country? Why would you vote to hand control to the big neighbour who doesn't actually even give those things to their own citizens? So that's what we need to think about when we go into that booth with our pen next Thursday, is if these are things that we want to control, if these are things that we really value, then we need to control them here. We need to make these decisions here. Because we can decide what we don't spend money on. We don't want to go around invading other people. We don't want brand new weapons of mass destruction on the Clyde. We don't want two useless great aircraft carriers with no aircraft. We would rather spend that money on our citizens. And that's the choice we would only have as an independent country. We will not have that choice if we are simply part of another country. So I hope that you'll be brave when you go into that booth and that you'll put your mark at the cross. But don't think that's you done. Because come the 19th, this can't go back in its box. You all have to stay up stay out, stay engaged, and be prepared to work. This isn't going to fall like manna from heaven. It's not going to be a land of milk and honey. We will literally have to build it one rivet, one plank, one nail at a time. So we are the generation who have the honour and the opportunity to make this incredible choice. And then we have to get up off our backsides. We'll have to stop whinging and gurning. We'll not be able to blame them. We'll not be able to blame Westminster. It'll be us. It'll be our decisions. But it'll be our responsibility. And it'll be our responsibility to build a better Scotland for that future generation. Thank you.